Valerie's leaving Zane out in the backseat of Volkswagen while she's at a bar and it's the middle of the winter. It's not safe. And I, I told her. Zane tried hard. He was, a, oh, he was such a sweet kid. He was so sweet, so loving. And he tried so hard to be what everybody wanted him to be. And he was just like a free spirit, a big smile on his face all the time. He would call me Miss Carolyn, Miss Carolyn, Miss Carolyn. <laughs> Zane Floyd was a sweet little guy who was very soft-spoken and gentle disliked conflict. When the kids would argue, he was just that kind of guy. He was, you get the situation calmed down. He was just a sweet, soft-spoken guy. The, the gentleness is, um, is something I often see when I meet someone with FASD for the first time. I, I describe it as a childlike quality. That's the brain damage. When he was standing, he would be kind of moving around, you know, like, and his head was always like, you know, going like this. It is impossible to recognize on first impression whether someone has FASD or not. Um, most individuals with FASD have learned in childhood to please people and to be accepted by being chatty, friendly, nice. So for somebody with FASD, I would, I would see this, um, dichotomy, considerable difficulty with complex tasks, not much difficulty with rote tasks that uh, the person performed over and over again. And there is no difference now in terms of the intellectual functioning between ID and FASD because they're both defined as executive functioning. Zane's FASD um definitely played into um, his ability to learn and develop and the way Mike treated him was part of that because he didn't learn and develop at the rate or in the way that maybe Mike thought he should. There was probably no way Zane was going to be able to please him. Zane had a, uh, a stepfather who would sit behind the backstop when Zane was catching and if a pass ball went by Zane, uh, his uh, stepdad would actually uh, yell at him, get upset at him. The ball players are listening to him. They know what's happening to Zane. His head would fall down and his, he would look at the ground and but he'd get in his position to catch the ball and uh, he took it all into heart no doubt about it had mike had a temper he did have, he had a major temper and when it when it boiled over it was excessive grabbing people by the hair or you know punching it's pretty that's pretty drastic when you're picking a kid up by his hair in the first place it's not a good thing it was excessive and it scared me even a little bit Mike was a scary guy. We got a call one night from Valerie asking my husband to come over, please, because Mike had hit her, tried to put her head through the wall or something like that. So we went over right away, and she was afraid for Zane and herself. I can remember one time they were sitting down to eat dinner. Mike started yelling at Zane, and Zane was just sitting there shaking. I mean, he could not even pick up the fork. He was just shaking so badly, and he was just scared to death. The kind of adversity he experienced in childhood has been found in the research to cause brain damage in and of itself. So this is an additive and cumulative insult on the brain damage he was born with. I think Zane wanted his father's love and his approval and show him I can be the man that you want me to be, you know. 
But then that was Zane denying himself. Jay and Zane lived together. They lived at the little house behind Mike and Valerie's for a little bit. Um, yeah, they were buds. You know, he was always there for me, always. Even when I came out, um, one big worry that I had was how he was gonna handle it. And it never paused for a second. He never changed, it never changed anything about the way we were. I wonder sometimes, um, maybe did Zane and Jay have a different relationship than I knew about? Maybe was he struggling with the thought of, um, am I maybe homosexual? Am I, and I don't know that, but I watch how they interacted, the conversations they had, and that there were just some different things there. I wonder if that contributed a lot to his feeling of maybe I'm not man enough, especially the way that society looked at that um, during that time. Maybe I don't measure up. Maybe if I go into the military, maybe if I just succeed, maybe if I remove myself from this situation, I'll finally um, be strong enough, be man enough, and finally get the approval. Of, of my dad. It, it always seemed like a very strange um, situation for me for Zane to enter the military. It didn't seem to fit who he was. I was a little cons just concerned in the sense that he was such a soft, peaceable, easygoing guy. I was concerned from those areas because I know in the core and boot camp, the big one, uh, they're going to do their best to weed out weakness. And, uh, and a lot of that has to do with putting a lot of pressure on you. I mean, that environment was kind of rough. I mean, you got to understand that most of the Marines I had were f kids that were out of high school less than a year. Yes, sir. Are you recording? Yes, sir. What a beautiful day in Gimbo, huh? I like this every day. Everything this kid did was live. He did live patrols. He, he got in skirmishes on the fence line. Cubans fired at him. He directed the fire of his team or his squad against that opposing force. And everything they did was real world contingency operations. So there was a lot of stress put on them. And they used to go seven days forward deployed on the fence line, sleeping on the ground for seven days straight. Marines have a huge amount of uh, responsibility that we thrust it upon them. We try to do the best to ensure that they're prepared for it, but sometimes uh, in operations, and Cuba was one of those in the 90s, uh, we had only scratched the surface in that, in that preparation. You really need to screen that those assignments much with much more scrutiny because you thrust the kid down there that and throw that responsibility at them. And if they're not ready for it, I think you do harm to the mission and you do harm to the kid. It's a tough thing. And you can put some guys in some situations that are just abusive. When you put the wrong guy in those situations, you put it, a guy who's already abused can do damage. He went from very carefree almost personality um, to a very burdened, heavy, mental struggle, I guess. When he came back, he was quiet. The only thing he would talk about was guns. Jay and Zane came over to spend New Year's with us at the house, and the conversation was guns. That's all they talked about. If I remember right, he was in some form of sniper training or gunner training, and um, he would talk about these things, and I remember thinking, that's not my cousin. He didn't understand that his constant talking about guns was turning off people. Repetitive behavior is another aspect 
of executive dysfunction. It's called perseveration. And it's a tendency to repeat over and over again something that is not having a positive effect. And once again, now he's lost and not knowing what to do. No direction. When he was, when he was in the Marines, he, he, was, he had some kind of structure. Individuals who have FASD do best in highly structured environments. When they're left to their own devices and have to think about what to do, when to do it, how to do it on their own, that's when the wheels come off the bus and they have significant problems because making those decisions requires intact executive function. He taught Marines how to kill, hunt and kill. And I just thought, there's no way this guy is ready to be back out here in the world. A lot of guys have uh, PTSD or they've, they're carrying some emotion and they're not going to claim it. And we're able at, the, at that out processing phase to identify some of that. But unfortunately, guys back in the 90s, they didn't have that. In fact, for junior Marines, it was like a one day, here's your checkout sheet, go check out at all these places. It was, uh, he wasn't happy. And I don't know if that has to do with what, I'm sure it's got a combination of what happened in the military and then him having to come home and have to deal with his dad again. I can just picture him now sitting on the bed, uh, looking at the closet and there were boxes on the floor and clothes strewn around the room, but hanging up perfectly in plastic was his Marine uniform. And he would just look at it, he would just stare at it. He seemed lost. Kind of like he didn't know what he what's my next mission. If I had to put it into words, like he was waiting for his next assignment. No one questions Zane's guilt. He doesn't question his guilt. The, the reason behind his guilt, why he did what he did, I think is what's at question. It's almost like he was a, a soldier going to battle. I think certainly when people, um, before people go into the military, before um, we entrust um, new recruits with, uh, with the knowledge and, and the weapons to do real damage, um, Screening is really, really important. If, we, if it's in the middle of 2005 and we needed to expand our numbers, good Lord, we'll take everybody who has a pulse. You're not, you don't have a pulse? We'll find a waiver for it. We'll get you in. Honestly, I feel at times, uh, as I'm enduring this whole thing, it's like, hey, what did I do that contributed to this, this uh, nightmare? I think that a lot can be learned if somebody would study him, you know, and which I'm sure they have over the years, um, and and try to prevent some other young man coming, you know, up out of maybe a military experience, and because you do, you hear about it that you know today. The truth is, when we look at the situation. Nothing in what he did fit his character. It didn't seem to be the man that he was. The morning that I, that it happened, I kept saying, I don't think that's Zane. I mean, I'd known Zane for, you know, a long time. I, I said, that's not Zane. It wasn't the Zane that, that I knew since he was a baby. I didn't think it was him at first, I guess. I didn't, or maybe I just didn't want to believe it was him. I don't know, I don't know. But it was name, there was his name, and there was, he was sitting there. His eyes, he just, it was just a strange thing, a zombie, I don't know the best way to describe it, of course, a scary individual that wasn't the Zane we knew. 
because I knew the kid that he had been, and I didn't understand what had happened. Yeah? Did they take responsibility for oh. remorse? I'm going to say the first words out of his mouth were, Mike, I've done something terrible. And that was the first sentence he could put together to me. And to me, that was Zane. I mean, that, that was more of a Zane that I would expect, that Zane's going to take responsibility. I'm an ultra-conservative, and I, I believe in the death penalty, and I always have, until this happened. <laughs> and it kind of makes you step back and think, because, because I knew Zane most of his life. And it's hard to, here we go, it's hard to, to see that coming from him at all. You see a guy who was just totally one decent person and one day in his life, something goes very awry and they break. I think he held out up until the point he snapped. I think he held out pretty well having all of that negative and all of that sad and all of that ugly in his life. We in the legal system are failing. Um, we're failing my cousin. We're failing, um, we're failing a, a man who, I think, whose who's military failed him, who very likely, whose family and friends failed him. They may not have known what they were doing, but they absolutely made him into the man that, that he was that night. Um, I would beg uh, the clemency board to say, please evaluate what you're doing. Please take into your hearts the kind of person he was before he went into the Marines and, and the loving person. I just, I really think he just had a total mental break. I don't know who who was there that day? But it wasn't the Zane that we all knew and loved. He, he's worthy. He's worthy to be saved from death. <laughs>